So I want to read in Lamentations chapter 5, starting in verse 19. This is the end of this, and it really is an example of how to close a prayer of grief. Have you ever just opened up your heart to the Lord? Sometimes we feel like we can't just say all that's touching our soul because we feel like in some way it's a lack of faith. It's not. It is not. It is something that is even modeled by Jeremiah. We're going to see other places in Scripture. It's throughout the Psalms it's modeled. It is appropriate to open up our souls and pour before God what we're experiencing. You know, we're not going to surprise Him, are we? Are we, going to, are we going to surprise God by telling Him about all the pain and grief and sorrow, the things that are deep in our soul? Not at all. You know, a one spouse might be able to surprise another spouse with the trouble going on in their hearts, but we will never be able to surprise God. And just as one spouse would want to hear it and be able to be there for their spouse, God is there for us. So as we're relating those things, it's not a matter of a lack of faith. It's not a weakness on our part to just pour out our souls to God, all right? But how do we close that time? When we're praying in that way, when we're, we're really relating to God, the pain, the grief, the sorrow. We just had this dear friend of ours. Today was a, a day, even though he knew that his wife, he knows his wife is with the Lord, 56 years married, when he called me last Wednesday, I could hear it in his voice. This is a time of sorrow. This is a strong, burly man, big-handed man, a plumber, a tough guy. We were deacons together. I could hear his voice cracking on the telephone. Okay, this is a time of sorrow and grief and pain. And uh, as he relates those things to the Lord, which I'm sure he has, uh, how do you end that kind of prayer? We have an example here. It's amazing. So, so let's just look at it. We have here, Jer uh, I'm sorry, Lamentations chapter 5, verse 19 to the end. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever, thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old, but thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your grace and for this time that we could have. Pray that you'd bless it, that you would minister to us. And uh, as all of us have seasons, and some may be in the midst of seasons of grief and pain and sorrow, of difficulty uh, that's just touching them deeply in their souls. We just pray that your wor word would just give that comfort and that help, and that uh, even we would be better strengthened to be able to really come to you uh, with this kind of prayer and to really open up our souls before you. We pray that you would bless in this time as we look at your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So how would you classify the book of Lamentations? Uh, it's evident that it is an extended cry of sorrow. It is an extended cry of sorrow. Uh, grief is a deep sorrow, often related to the death or loss of someone. But you might understand this. There, there is death and loss that is not an individual, but is exceptionally deep to the soul. There are other things we lose and that we grieve about. There are pain. There's pain that we go through in our, in our souls. This is an extended cry of sorrow. I already mentioned this is uh, in the historical background. It has to do with uh, uh, Judah, Jerusalem being taken captive uh, by the Babylonian Empire. Uh, there's a national disaster, 586 B.C. Uh, Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem, including the temple, took many, most of the people in exile, left some of the poor behind, left Jeremiah behind. I just finished reading through Jeremiah. Uh, but here you have these five chapters. It's interesting, really, they look at the five chapters as five individual poetic sections that really kind of stand on their own, uh, but they all have that common theme to them. Culturally, it's interesting. This book 
is read in synagogues each year on a fast day, the ninth or fifth, I'm sorry, the, the fifth of the Hebrew months, on the ninth day of the fifth of the Hebrew months. And it commemorates the destruction of Jerusalem. The title uh, of this particular book in the Hebrew is Eka. I'd like to show you where that comes from. Look back at chapter 1, and you'll see it. Look at chapter 1. What's the very first word in chapter 1? Yeah, how. Okay, now, uh, you really, to be able to grasp this, you really kind of need to take it in with, with emotional depth. Okay, if you can kind of think of somebody uh, using their hands and just asking that question, how? That's, that would be more of a, uh, how this would relate to us. It, uh, it could be the idea of, you know, how or in what way? How is this even possible? And it's repeated throughout. It's here in uh, chapter 1, 1. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. You're going to see it there again. How hath the Lord covered the da daughter of Zion? Look over at chapter 4 in verse 1. We have the same thing there. How is the gold become dim? And so uh, the Jewish people pick that up as the title. That is the title for them to this book. Imagine replacing Lamentations with something in our modern understanding or equivalent to that. How is this even possible if that were the title? Uh, that's what they would be reminded of and reminded yearly of as they would look at this and commemorate that. It's a skillfully structured book, as one writes, uh, five separate poems, as I already mentioned, but they all have this in common. They are all a cry of sorrow regarding what has taken place. They're under God's chastening. Now, this is interesting, I think. If you read through it, I went through the entire uh, book of Lamentations in preparation for this. I listened to it. I marked some things on, on my copy uh, on my computer from the book. It is this complaint of sorrow, but it's not just reflection. Okay. What you're going to find as you read through the book is you're going to find him reflecting on his sorrow and the grief and the pain. And right in the midst of that, he, he just immediately is also speaking to the Lord. In fact, you have an example of that. If you look over at chapter 1, look at it, verse 8, and it says this, Jerusalem hath grievously sinned, therefore she is removed. All that honored her despise her, because they have seen her nakedness. Yea, she sigheth and turneth backwards. Her filthiness is in her skirts. She remembereth not her last end. Therefore she came down wonderfully. She had no comforter. O oh Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy hath magnified himself. Now, he doesn't, there's not like this stop. That's one continuous expression. And what that tells me is this. Though there are some places in Lamentations where he talks to the people, that's, that's a smaller section or sections really dominating this is reflections complaint of sorrow and grief interspersed with cries out to the Lord. That's telling me that this is all to God. Everything, if you look at chapter 1, verse 8 and following, all the way down, it happens again. He continues in verse 10, down through verse 11, same kind of thing, the complaint, the sorrow, the grief, the pain. Then he says, right after that, see, O Lord, and consider, for I am become vile. And you, you see what's happening there. It's not that those are like, okay, period, new paragraph, and so Jeremiah prayed unto God. That is all a prayer. Okay, so the prayer is the part when he's talking about Jerusalem and what has taken place there. And the prayer is when he does address God directly. So this is words of sorrow unto God, and that really is what I want us to see. You, you have an example for us set in inspired scripture that we can make application, principial application to our own lives, right? How many of us are going to be taken captive by the Babylonians in our lifetime? Is anybody anticipating that? <laughs> no, right? 
So that's not the application, right? We're not, we're not thinking that's going to happen. So can we make a parallel application? Absolutely. Anything that then touches us with sorrow, that causes grief, pain in our lives, in our souls, is parallel to this. And we have an inspired record of what to do with that. That's precious. This, this is really saying to us, this is a right response. This is a spiritual response. Okay, break out of the mold of that strong, you know, got to toughen it up. Yeah, I'm not saying that we just need to be always carrying a Kleenex box with us, but Jeremiah was known as what, as what prophet? The, the weeping prophet. And that's connected even to this, and maybe even predominantly as you see it within this, but also seen back in the book of Jeremiah when he talks about that. Uh, Jeremiah models this right response to God. Listen to what one theologian writes. Prayers of anguish to clear away every, they, they, or this is what they do, they clear away every vestige of self-righteousness. Okay, prayers of anguish will do that. that. That is humbling yourself. That is casting, that is forgetting yourself and bringing the complaint and the pain before God. He continues, the weight of the poems is to plumb the depths of human anguish and despair and to speak about such experiences to whom? To the Lord. He's, he's nailing exactly what we're trying to say too. You have five chapters here and it's not just complaint in a closet to himself. He is, he is listing these things out to, the, to God and interspersing that with request. What would, we, what would we need to change, or what would need to change in us to be this kind of believer? Just recently, I was talking to somebody, and they were, they were regretting that, and this was a man, they were, he was regretting that he was becoming more emotional. And he talked about, you know, if he goes to a funeral, how it just touches him, or he sees something, it just touches him, just breaks his heart, and he finds himself being brought to tears. And I, I didn't really have a good chance to talk with him, but, you know, we're made in the image of whom? And, and who was it that wept at their friend's tomb? Right. It's, it's a good thing. One other writer says this, the frankness of the language and lamentations should persuade people that God is open. God is open, and listen to what he says, to their real feelings and their honest reactions to tragedy. God is open to that. There is no answer in the immediacy of overwhelming tragedy, and one's prayers ought to reflect that. I remember a time I uh, was talking with somebody who would be a mature believer. I would consider this person to be a mature believer. And they had told me about someone who's, I forget if it was a child or somebody younger. I forget the, the age of the person, but there was a, a tragic, sudden, let's just not use the word tragic because I'm going to use that in a minute. There was a sudden, unexpected death of that person. And uh, I don't remember if there were children that they had or, or what it all was, but there was a lot in it that would move you when you heard the story. And I, I was just moved by it. And I said something like this. I said, wow, I said, that is so tragic. And the person tried to correct me. And what I would do, I don't know the exact words, but I would say this. It was kind of this idea of, well, we need to just bolster ourselves up against that. We need to not consider it as a thing of such deep sorrow. Okay? And what I think he's saying here in this is that what we find reflected in this book and what this theologian is commenting on is that it's appropriate <laughs> for us to bring these things before God and, and even before other believers. It's appropriate. It's appropriate for that person that was talking to me recently to be moved and moved to tears. 
That's good. But now who else is it that modeled pouring out our sorrow and our grief in prayer in Scripture? Who else did that? Jesus did. Yeah, there's others we could talk about. We go through the Psalms. But think about Jesus. Where did Jesus do that? Okay, he did it in Gethsemane. And when you look at that, is, is he relating with full frankness to his heavenly Father the grief of his soul? Absolutely. And it's in the inspired record. Now, I don't know if you've ever considered this before, but have you also considered that in Psalm 22, where that starts with what Christ said on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Psalm 22, have you ever considered the title or what has been given as the title to that psalm? The psalm has been given the title, the psalm of the, can anybody finish the next word? The psalm of the, what? It, where, did, where was he when he said that? Yeah, the psalm of the cross. Now, if we were just to take, just a, if I was just to read just a portion of it, you're going to get the idea here. I believe that there's very good likelihood that this was a reflection in the heart of Christ. So I couldn't say that with you know, great confidence because it's not recorded in the Gospels. He does speak the first part of it, but the rest of it is actually stated by the same person who speaks the first part, who we know is Christ. And just listen to it. Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night sees him, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and they were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. He goes on to say, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. Who does that sound like? Jesus. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head. They, this is what they say. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. That's verse 8 of Psalm 22, a thousand years before Christ was on the cross. That is what they said to him, right? So I think this is a psalm of, of grief and sorrow of the Messiah. So yes, we have some in Gethsemane that's inspired and preserved. We have a few words from the cross, but you have this psalm of lament, of grief. And it is the heart of the Messiah. So here's a question I have for us. Then how can we close a time of prayer like this? How can we bring it to a right closure? All right. I think we have a model here. And we're just going to pull this out. It's very simple. This is, this is front-loaded. Our time tonight is front-loaded. This part's very simple. This is how we can close that time of prayer. Here it is. First point. Anchor your, anchor your faith in God's sovereignty. Anchor your faith. And as you close the time of prayer, anchor your faith in God's sovereignty. And you know what? I think that's better possible to the person who has poured out his or her soul and the grief that's, that's there. They've laid it all before God, casting all your care upon him for he what? Cares for you. So <laughs> here it is. Listen to the... Listen to it in the, in, in, it was what we have here. Thou, O Lord, remainest forever thy throne from generation to generation. Now, I want to read you another translation. I looked at it, I looked at three translations besides this one. The other three translate the first part of this verse differently. Uh, both, two of them were Bible translations. One was a translation found in a commentary. I don't know if that was the, the commentator's personal translation of the Hebrew himself, or if he was taking out, out from one translation. But three, three other translations translate the first part differently. And let's look at it. You see where it says, Thou, O Lord, remainest forever? This is how it's translated. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. It pulls out what he's doing there. It pulls out. He's not commanding him to reign forever. He's saying, but you, Lord, 
even though all this is coming apart in my experience, my life, all this sorrow, all this pain, all this grief, all this is happening. In contrast to all of that, you are set on your throne. And your throne is eternal. That is powerful. He, he is anchoring himself. He's anchoring his, his, faith, his faith deep in the sovereignty of God. Now, what does that sovereignty include? Okay. Well, I would put it this way. It is anchoring in it in him being immo immovable, eternal, and all-powerful. And I think you have it here at the uh, bottom. It says, the Lord is all-powerful and exercises his will, his righteous judgments, and his loving care from his eternal throne. He doesn't, that throne's never going away from him. It's eternal. That's the idea in the text. And from that throne, by his omnipotent hand, he exercises his will, his judgments, and his caring love. He does it all from that throne. And it's omnipotent. That's why he is sovereign. With That's the kind of sovereign you want, and that's the only one that can be sovereign. Any earth, earthly throne could be taken away. Someone who's not all-powerful, he could be taken away. But here we have one who's perfectly just and perfectly loving, and he has all of that upon his throne. Now listen to this, if this would be a help to us. Deuteronomy 33, 26 to 29. And what I would say here is, as, as we look at some of this, maybe, maybe at least some part of this one word, one phrase, might just be the thing that would really encourage you, okay, that you could kind of take away with you. Okay, Deuteronomy 33, 26 to 29. There is none like unto the God of Jeshurun, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and his excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, destroy them. Israel then shall dwell in safety alone. Okay, this is the sovereign God that he is anchoring his faith in. Psalm 10. The Lord, verse 16 to 18, the Lord is king forever and ever. The heathen are perished out of his land. In other words, out of his land as the sovereign, in his justice, they have perished out of his land. Lord, thou hast heard the desire of the humble. Thou wilt prepare their heart. Thou wilt cause thine ear to hear, to judge the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may no more oppress. So have you ever known of somebody been in a situation where they have been under the oppression of another person? That becomes an incredible bondage that they really don't even, they don't even have to be like enchained to a chair in the house. They, they will feel underneath that bondage wherever they go and they will come back to it. They are oppressed underneath it. Here they will be wholly delivered by the sovereign God. Psalm 29 verses 10 and 11, the Lord sitteth upon the flood, yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. So here's, he exercises not only his justice, but his loving kindness from that throne. The entirety of his will is affected through his sovereign position. Now, one commentary listed some modern applications of this book. And listen to this one. This is one out of like, I think maybe a half dozen. Though many solutions for human suffering have been proposed, ultimately the only satisfactory way to deal with it is through deep and abiding faith. That's our anchor, our deep and abiding faith in God in spite of the circumstances. I like to, sometimes in spite of means you don't consider them. How about this? In the face of the circumstances. You're right in front of them. I mean, right in front of them, right in the midst of them, you're just taking that anchor and you're setting it right in your sovereign God. And so again, uh, the last statement there, uh, a fundamental to being able to trust God is who he is and what he does. That's our statement on the sheet who he is and what it does. So next point. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to anchor our faith in God's sovereignty. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to plead with God for His mercy. Plead with God. Beg Him over and over in the book of Lamentations. He is pleading with God for His mercy. You see it in these kinds of ways, like verse 20. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? That is a pleading. He, that is a begging for mercy to be shown. How long is it going to be, Lord? <laughs> He's pleading for mercy. Uh, listen to some of these others. Uh, Psalm 44, 24 to 26. See how it's connected with mercy. Very similar to what, Jer- what Jeremiah says here in Lamentations. Wherefore hidest thou thy face, and forgettest our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust, our belly cleaveth unto the earth. Arise for our help, and redeem us for thy mercy's sake. You see the connection? You're not doing anything. It's, it's, it's really, you could, you, could, you could make it seem like it's a complaint, but it's a begging for mercy. He's calling upon the Lord to show mercy to him. That's what he's doing in Lamentations. That's what he's doing in uh, Psalm 44. One writer says this, it's highly significant that there's no attempt anywhere in Lamentations to request restoration. All that is asked for is God's return. God continues to be remembered and the memory is kept alive in the complaints. They are placed before God in hope that God's compassion will be aroused. And that's what he's doing. He is calling out, hoping, he's looking for, he's, it's a way of pleading for mercy to be upon him. What about this out of Psalm 13? And look at, remember what he says, Wherefore, in verse 20, dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Now Psalm 13, how long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Does that seem similar to what Jeremiah and the children of Israel were experiencing? Absolutely. He cries out, consider and hear me, O Lord, lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the, the, sleep, the sleep of death. And then he says this, verse 5, but I have trusted in thy mercy. They're going hand in hand. How long has it been? I'm trusting your mercy. Same thing in Psalm 77. Wilt thou, wilt the Lord cast off forever? Verse 7 to 9. Will he be fa- uh, favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? It says later in verse 9, hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? That's a way of pleading for mercy. When, when they're saying that, they're, they're, they're saying in a humble way, Lord, we beg you, show us mercy in in our lives. In Psalm 85, wilt thou be angry with us forever? Verse 5, wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord. You know, each time in those Psalms where the word mercy is used, it's a word in the Old Testament that speaks of God's faithful, loyal love every single time. We might say the idea of grace and what they're pleading for in all those cases is that God would show them mercy. So we have this, how to close this time of prayer of grief is to anchor our faith in God's sovereignty in the prayer. And in the prayer, pray with God, plead with God, I'm sorry, for His mercy. And then thirdly is seek for God to draw you. What do you mean by that? Well. Ask God to draw you to himself. In other words, we're asking God, the close of the prayer, to govern our hearts, our souls, our minds, our affections, and draw us to himself, to change our hearts, to bring us to himself. That's what we're asking for. Look at what the psalm says, or the uh, lamentation says in verse 21 and 22. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. And he says this, but thou hast utterly rejected us. Thou art very wroth against us. And uh, really the idea there uh, in that closing part is really recognizing 
what has taken place, but also that that is not a possibility, that there is confidence. I think it was, um, I think it was Calvin that pointed out that this particular phrase is something that God would not do to his own. One other uh, commentary makes this uh, last statement, translates it this way, unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. One writer says this, the prayer of anyone suffering in any capacity should be that of chapter 3, verse 21, restore to us yourself, O Lord, that we may return, renew our days as of old. That is 521. So what is what is it that we're looking for as we close? Okay, Do you recognize that in the time of grief and sorrow and pain that, that we are totally without strength in our, our, it, it has a it has a way of just bringing us down and to be weak as we just looked at last week it, in first peter why does the adversary like a roaring lion why is he in the midst of the end of that chapter on suffer, on that whole book on suffering why is he there in that part because we're so susceptible when we're suffering right and jeremiah knew for himself and for the people they were they were being chastised. What does it say in Hebrews chapter twelve? When you're chastened, <laughs> I mean you're going to feel you're going to have weak knees. Your your hands are going to be hanging down. And what he is pleading for, and what we need to plead for in those times, is that God would draw our hearts close to Him. This is a work of God alone. In Ezekiel eleven and also Jeremiah thirty two, it points to this as a work of God. He says this in uh, Ezekiel eleven nineteen and twenty: I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. Now I'll take the stony heart out of their flesh, and will give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. They shall be my people, and be and I will be their God. Now it's talking about the new covenant, but it's pointing to this. It's talking about what what happens to us in salvation. It's pointing to this: God's the one that does it. So as we anchor our faith in prayer, anchor our faith in God's sovereignty, we plead with Him for mercy in our situation. Then we, we close in prayer by begging Him to draw our hearts close to Him. So with that, I just want to look at this closing prayer. And, and this is the closing prayer. It's from Habakkuk. The prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet upon Shagianoth. O Lord, I have heard thy speech, and I was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember what? Mercy. Remember mercy. In this difficult time, whatever it may be, remember mercy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we do thank you for your grace. Just pray you'd bless and that